Good evening, and welcome to the Osteopathic Founders Foundation e Human Clinical Update. I'm Sherry Wise, the EO of the Foundation, and I want to thank you for your attendance. This evening, our topic is gastroesophageal esophageal reflux disease, and we're so fortunate to have as our presenter, Dr. Trace Heathner. Dr. Heathner is a second-year gastroenterology fellow at Oklahoma State University. He's a graduate of the OSU College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed his internal medicine residency at Baylor, Scott and White in Temple, Texas, before accepting a position as a hospitalist at Citizens Memorial Hospital in Bolivar, Missouri. Dr. Heatner is board certified by the American Board of Internal Medicine. Dr. Heatner has no financial disclosures in relationship to this presentation. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Heatner. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wise, for the uh, introduction. I'd like to thank the Osteopathic Founders Foundation for uh, bringing together uh, tonight's presentation. Again, my name is Trace Eager, a second year gastroenterology fellow, and tonight's presentation is on gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. So an overview of tonight's presentation. Uh, here we'll start with the definition, kind of move through the pathophysiology and epidemiology, clinical presentations, and complications of GERD, the diagnosis and management. Tonight's learning objectives we highlighted in red, and they are as follows. What are the two cardinal symptoms of uncomplicated GERD? You'll be able to define the most common differentials of GERD. When to refer to us, gastroenterology or EGD evaluation, and what lifestyle changes have been shown to improve GERD. We'll start off with the definition. As you can see, uh, one of the learning objectives here with the cardinal symptoms. But the Montreal consensus defines GERD as symptoms or complications resulting from reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus or sometimes beyond. The cardinal symptoms are going to be heartburn and also at times regurgitation. Regurgitation being uh, the uh, contents of uh, the stomach being uh, brought all the way back up into the mouth. The way that I like to explain uh, GERD to my patients or describe it for them, I'm asking them about it kind of in layman's terms, if you will, would be uh, whenever your stomach acid comes back up into your esophagus and it causes problems, causing trouble. Subcategories uh, of GERD can be broken up into non-erosive reflux disease, erosive esophagitis, and Barrett's esophagus. Learning uh, objective number two would be to find the, dif to define the differentials of GERD and uh, there are three main ones I want to draw our attention to. The first one being non-erosive reflux disease. And the second one, reflux hypersensitivity. And third one, functional heartburn. So these three diagnoses will be in patients who have a normal esophagus on EGD. And usually biopsies have been taken and are normal of the esophagus as well. These three differentials, non-erosive reflux disease, reflux hypersensitivity, and functional heartburn can be uh, defined by the presence or absence of two things. One is abnormal acid exposure in the esophagus, and two, whether or not their symptoms are related to this abnormal acid exposure. For non-erosive reflux disease, these patients do have abnormal amounts of acid exposure, too much acid coming from the stomach, refluxing back up into the esophagus. And their symptoms are from this abnormal acid exposure. Patients with reflux hypersensitivity have a uh, normal amount of uh, acid exposure, meaning that in typical, in, in just the average, in average patients, 
all humans have a normal amount of acid exposure in the esophagus. Patients with reflux hypersensitivity are hypersensitive to this normal amount of reflux. They get symptoms with the normal reflux that happens throughout the day. On the contrary, patients with functional heartburn have a normal amount of reflux, no increased amount of reflux, but their symptoms aren't necessarily related to these reflux symptoms. They have symptoms kind of all throughout the day or many times, not at all related to the reflux. Patients with functional heartburn might be more likely to respond to tricyclic antidepressants, SSRIs, SMRIs, and such. I'll have questions throughout the presentation this evening, uh, kind of be scattered throughout. And for the most part, we just run through them pretty quickly. This first one's a 55-year-old woman who complains of daily retrosternal burning after eating meal. A wireless pH study performed off acid depression shows an acid exposure time of 6%. Normal acid exposure time is less than 4%. Greater than 6% is abnormal, as we'll see shortly. And so she has an abnormal amount of acid exposure. She has multiple reflux episodes, mostly postprandial, no nocturnal episodes. Which of the following pathophysiologic factors contribute to her elevated acid, uh, esophageal acid exposure? The bipolar increased gastric acid production, increased saliva production, pulls towards the second state for postprandial gastric distension. This is postprandial gastric distension. One of the risk factors for GERD is going to be increased abdominal cavity pressure or increased uh, uh, substances within the stomach descending the stomach, leading to increased reflux. Bipolar doesn't really uh, answer this, it's a risk factor there. Increased gastric acid production is incorrect because most patients with GERD actually have a normal amount of acid production. They just have too much reflux, either too frequent reflux or too large of a volume of reflux. Increased saliva production you're actually would actually help uh, your reflux because saliva would help neutralize uh, the acid. Path moving on to the pathophysiology of GERD, it's multifactorial. There's lots of studies to kind of nail down what the main uh, uh, factor is. I want to kind of focus in on this transient lower esophageal into relaxation. So at the bottom of the esophagus, right before it empties into the stomach, you have a sphincter, the lower esophageal sphincter. And it normally relaxes at certain times throughout the day, uh, you typically after meals to allow for venting of, of air that's been caught in the stomach back to, to the escape. And it's a normal amount. Uh, it's a normal uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, however, patients with GERD are sometimes shown to have an increased rate, increased frequency of the sphincter relaxation, leading to increased reflux. Also, you could have loss of lower sphincter turn, tone, tidal hernia, large gastric volume, increased abdominal pressure, such as obesity, like I mentioned a minute ago. Other uh, pathophysiology mechanisms impair clearance of the reflux state from the esophagus, clearing it back down into the stomach. It can be impaired because of a hiatal hernia, because of obstruction, or impaired uh, oral secretions. Increased toxic potential, uh, rarely zoner ellison or uh, bile in the gastric fluids uh, can increase the toxicity there. And um, there have been several studies which have uh, looked at to try to answer the question of does the acid itself cause tissue damage to the esophagus or does the acid produce something else that causes the damage and actually that something else would be inflammation and so acid inflames the esophageal cells and causes inflammation in the cells and that can lead to the, some of the complications of GERD, such as esophagitis or Barrett's disease. Altered sensitivity uh, is also a pathophysiologic mechanism. We have decreased sensitivity in some patients, such as patients with Barrett's esophagus, 
Older patients have decreased sensitivity to reflux diabetic patients. Some patients have heightened sensitivity, such as those with uh, life stressors, hypervigilance. Which of the following is associated with an increase in the frequency of the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation? Which one causes an increase in frequency? Baclofen, esophageal outflow obstruction, gastric acid hypersecretion, mean body mass, or obstructive sleep apnea. And this one, the risk factor here, is actually your obstructive sleep apnea. So the transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation, I mentioned the mechanism uh, and postulated by which most GERD occurs. That's the gastric distension stimulates the, the vagal reflex, allowing venting of air from the stomach, uh, sleep, apnea, obesity, and colonic fermentation have been shown to be risk factors. In which of the following settings is the likelihood of future complications of reflux disease, such as erosive esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, the lowest. In patients with H. pylori, idle hernia, male gender, obesity, or older age. This one is actually H. pylori. Strangely enough, H. pylori, especially if it's located mostly in the proximal stomach, closest to the esophagus, has been shown to uh, lead to decreased, uh, decreased risk of patients with GERD. And the way that they found this are in some studies, after patients were treated for H. pylori, you could have an increased risk of esophageal disease, such as erosive esophagitis. The association wasn't as convincing in patients with H. pylori located primarily in the distal stomach. Epidemiology of GERD, it is the most commonly diagnosed GI disorder. About 9 million outpatient visits a year attributed to it. It's mostly a disease of adults. And greater than half of the adults will have GERD symptoms at some point during their lifetime. And the prevalence is increasing substantially over the past 25 years, likely as a combination of increase of uh, the risk factors of obesity, obstructive sleep apnea. Risk factors of GERD increased age, obesity, smoking, idle hernia. NSAIDs and aspirin, IBS, anxiety, and depression. Uh, no or inconsistent association, diet, alcohol, and caffeine. However, you do get uh, pretty rarely talk patients to comment that certain caffeine, specifically coffee, will increase their symptoms of GERD. And then as far as diet goes, uh, you know, spicy foods uh, like Mexican food, like that uh, will increase their symptoms. So although uh, epidemiologic studies have not shown an association with diet, alcohol, and caffeine, you will have antidotes of, uh, from patients uh, saying that uh, anecdotally they do uh, have these associations. I think they're at decreased risk with H. pylori, specifically uh, proximal stomach H. pylori. Which of the following conditions is associated with increased perception of reflux episodes? Anxiety, Barrett's, diabetes, older age, or sleep issues such as sleep apnea. The increased perception is going to be associated with patients with anxiety disorders. And here it would be helpful for us to distinct, to differentiate abnormal reflux with abnormal perception of reflux. And if patients do have abnormal reflux, your differentials in that case are going to be reflux esophagitis, as seen on EGD, with the complication there of strictures, or Barrett's esophagus, as seen on EGD, eventually adenocarcinoma, or dental erosions, or pulmonary aspirations. So those latter two, what we'll call extra esophageal manifestations. Of GERD. In the middle where reflux and perceptions meet, 
you'll have the differentials of the heartburn that patients will complain about, regurgitation, chest pain, and cough. Abnormal perception, but with normal reflux, your differentials at that point include reflux hypersensitivity, functional heartburn, globus sensation, which is the sensation of I've got something stuck in my chest. Food goes down fine. The patients don't have any dysphagia. It doesn't hurt them to swallow. They don't have to be dynophagia. They just have this sensation of something stuck in their chest or in the back of their throat, a globus sensation. Irritable larynx or belching disorder. Clinical presentation at GERD brings us through uh, uh, to the classic symptoms there as one of the learning objectives. The heartburn being the number one uh, classic high relief heartburn. Also, uh, ask for regurgitation, less common. Range of symptoms. Uh, I Let's keep in mind that uh, you can have a varying uh, types of symptomatic presentations, and some may not develop until they actually develop complications from the reflux, such as esophagitis, restriction, or Barrett's esophagus. Elderly are less symptomatic, but they have higher rates of erosive esophagitis, probably because they're less symptomatic and it takes them longer to seek care. Other symptoms are epigastric burning, although less commonly, so we call this epigastric. Common uh, complication symptoms, so they, if they have a complication, they might present with dysphagia. If they had the esophageal stricture or a dynophagia, they have esophagitis, weight loss, they have adenocarcinoma, or even hemophilus. The red flag or alarm signs or symptoms. These are patients that come into your office. These will be the questions that you'll ask to determine the uh, uh, increased need for referral to gastroenterology to have an EGD done. For unintentional weight loss, iron deficiency anemia, new onset GERD past the age of 50, they haven't had the symptoms prior to 50. Family history of esophageal cancer, or dysphagia. Complications of GERD include reflux esophagitis. You can often, often see ulcerations with the esophagitis. And what things you might see on the lab would be iron deficiency anemia from just a slow trickle of esophagitis bleed or actually overt bleeding. It's pretty common for us to do an upper endoscopy for a consult for hematemesis, for coffee ground emesis, and for the ending diagnosis of the esophagitis or ulcerative esophagitis. Patients also can have the complication of Barrett's esophagus. Uh, with the esophagitis, if it's severe enough over time, you can develop strictures. And if the stricture becomes 12 millimeters approximately or less, then patients will begin to have the symptom of dysphagia, difficulty, food passing from the mouth to the stomach. Extraesophageal manifestation or complications include lary uh, laryngeal cough, although the association is difficult to prove, dental erosion, and otitis. The way that we grade esophagitis, I thought would be helpful to present. There are four different um, uh, grades. And the classification system is called the LA grade classification. A, B, C, and D, with A being the uh, most minimal, is the picture up on the top left. So at four, so in the center of the screen is the um, uh, gastroesophageal junction going on down. The hole there in the middle is going on down into the stomach and all these pictures. So you're at the bottom of the esophagus getting ready to empty into the stomach. On that top left picture, at four o'clock, you can see a little red spot. That's a little bit of inflammation, esophagitis. However, the red spot is, looks like it's less than five millimeters, and it doesn't go very uh, far around, circumferentially around the esophagus. And the length and circumference 
of the esophagitis would be how we grade the uh, classification with the LA classification. So in this top left, that's going to be grade A. Top right, you're going to have LA grade B esophagitis. You'll see two streaks of uh, esophageal inflammation that are greater in length than five millimeters. Both of those will probably be closer to one centimeter, but it does not expand circumferentially around two folds or more, two folds of the esophagus. Grade C esophagitis in the bottom left picture. Again, you have the greater than five millimeter link there, and you have uh, uh, inflammation that goes over two folds or more. There you see it goes over three, two folds, maybe up to three folds even, but it's less than 75% circumferential around the esophagus. And then grade D in the bottom right, make sure you have complete circumferential inflammation, grade D esophagitis. As far as Barrett's esophagus, the way that we measure that would be with uh, what's called the PROG classification. Similar to esophagitis, we're going to measure the length and the circumference of the uh, Barrett's esophagus changes. Barrett's esophagus is when the uh, typical squamous lining the esophagus is replaced by columnar epithelium with goblet cells. And usually the read you'll get from pathology if you take a biopsy of it will be intestinal metaplasia. The diagram on the bottom right will show you how to look at the COG classification. Uh, the uh, circumferential measurement there of the Barrett's esophagus from the anatomic EGJ, esophagogastric junction, proximal to the Z line is approximately two centimeters, so C2. And then uh, up further than that is the maximum circumference of what we call a tongue up another centimeter, and so C2M1. Risk of progression from Barrett's esophagus uh, with intestinal metaplasia to high-grade dysplasia or adenocarcinoma is approximately 0.5 to 2% per year. A couple studies I want to point out to you as far as Barrett's esophagus goes is this ProGERD study. They uh, recruited 6,000 symptomatic patients, did an EGD on them, diagnosed them with either GERD or non-erosive reflux disease. They watched them over five years. They repeated their EGD to determine the risk of progression with GERD or NERD to Barrett's esophagus at five years. If you have non, at the uh, initial EGD, non-erosive reflux disease, your risk of progression to GERD is about 6%. If you on the index EGD, had grade A or B esophagitis, your risk of progression 12%, grade C or D esophagitis, almost one in five, 20%. Conclusion, most patients with GERD remain stable or improve over a five-year observation, and they don't actually end up progressing to Barrett's esophagus. At the same time, uh, patients don't always go on the spectrum, oh, you don't always see the spec patients go on the spectrum of GERD symptoms, then later esophagitis, then later Barrett's esophagus, their initial presentation might be Barrett's esophagus. And in that case, patient with Barrett's esophagus, the question to ask them is, what is my risk of progressing to adenocarcinoma? And these on the bottom right is another study that looked at the risk factors for progression of, adeno, of Barrett's esophagus to adenocarcinoma. They considered mel sex, catch nine points, they were smoking five points, the length of the Barrett's, one point per centimeter, and then confirmed low grade dysplasia on biopsy. You add all of those points up, and you can see on the right, your risk of progression is either low, intermediate, or high, depending on how many points you had determines your annual risk of progression to adenocarcinoma. Diagnostics is the next section. Uh, trial with PPI, endoscopy, ambulatory, 
pH testing of the esophagus, manometry, and Barrett's uh, diagnostic for Barrett's. So among patients with non-erosive reflux disease, which of the following factors predicts symptom improvement with PPI? So patients with non-erosive reflux disease, who will improve on PPI? Abnormal esophageal biopsy, abnormal pH studies, absence of hiatal hernia, presence of acid regurgitation, or reflux in ovarian swallow. The answer here is going to be abnormal pH study. And uh, the uh, reason is that the patients with non erosive disease uh, are going to have a patients with non erosive disease, by definition, will have an abnormal pH study. So those patients should improve on PPI. If they have a normal pH study, meaning the acidity in the esophagus is at a normal amount. And they're probably not going to improve on PPI therapy. Diagnostics of GERD, it's a typical symptom. You have the patient who presents to you with heartburn and regurgitation. You can, at this point, make a uh, assuming no alarm symptoms are present, make a presumptive diagnosis of GERD, and you can trial PPI therapy. The guidelines actually encourage. Use to do that to see if it helps their symptoms. Uh, if, if the complaint is more of chest pain, obviously you proceed with the cardiac evaluation. But the barium esophagram is not helpful in these situations and it really has no role in the diagnosis of GERD. Manometry as well has no role in the diagnosis of GERD, and manometry's main role is to rule out achalasia or an obstruction in cases of GERD who are going to undergo surgery. We want to move straight to EGD, meaning no PPI trial, move straight to EGD if red flag symptoms are present, those alarm symptoms that I mentioned earlier. Or if you just think the patient, in your opinion, has a high risk of complications, high risk of progressing. If they have very And the patients who are PPI refractory, when you try them on the PPI trial and they haven't improved, they would benefit from having this done. That brings us to our uh, learning objective uh, number three when to refer for EGD and see the indications there. The role of ambulatory pH monitoring uh, is uh, patients who are uh, uh, PPI refractory, and so you diagnose them with non-erosive reflux disease, meaning the EGD was normal, biopsy esophagus, unremarkable, but they're improving with PPIs, and either they don't want to take PPIs, they can afford PPIs, or for some other reason, can't take them, and they want, they're opting to have surgery to control their GERD or their non-erosive reflux disease, then uh, you might uh, consider pH monitoring. Another reason to consider pH monitoring would be when you're skeptical that they actually have GERD and you think they might have reflux hypersensitivity or they might have uh, functional heartburn. EG is not indicated if they uh, their only present their only presentation is patients with asthma. Patients with chronic cough, patients with laryngitis, and that's their only presenting complaint. And no heartburn, just have these other things, not an indication to do an EGD. I uh, want to point out here is from the guidelines for GERD. Two things I want to point out from this slide uh, is again kind of getting home on the barium esophagram, not for diagnosing GERD, but can be helpful the diagnosis of dysphagia to rule out stricture or rings. But again, those are things that. We'll typically see with an EGD. And then esophageal manometry's only role in the, in the uh, management of GERD is pre-op evaluation for patients wanting to go undergo surgery. Inventory pH testing is where we place endoscopically, place a probe in the lower esophagus to measure the pH. The 
um, we typically have the patients hold their PPI usually for a week or so, uh, varies by the provider prior to undergoing this test. And the monitor should collect data for about 96 hours, four days. And then it, the monitor will just fall off on its own and be passed to the school. The monitor is placed with endoscopy uh, five to six centimeters proximal to the topogastric junction. And it measures um, a couple of, it measures two things. And, and the first thing is going to be the acid exposure time. Less than 4% acid exposure time is normal, greater than 6% is abnormal. It also numbers the, measures the number of reflux events, less than 40 normal, greater than 80 abnormal. And then if the patients can keep a log with when they had their symptoms, you can also track this symptom reflux association. Are my symptoms associated with my reflux event? Here's a diagram. Uh, from probably the people who uh, sell the Bravo capsule, the name of the uh, uh, company here. Uh, and so uh, we uh, uh, passed this uh, probe down into the distal esophagus after measuring, after the correct measure. That's in A. In column B, there you can see the, caps the uh, capsule itself uh, suctions up the esophageal mucosa. In C, you can see the attachment, and then E, you remove your probe. And then E, that capsule is sitting there giving you readings to an external reporting device. The patient will bring back in external device for analysis. I know you can't read the details of this slide, but just to give you an idea of what the report looks like when we get it. On the y-axis, you will have the pH, lower pH being further down, being more acidic. And on the x-axis, you have time. And with the lower pH readings are those uh, heavy, dark areas that go towards the bottom of the chart uh, during the time are episodes of excessive acid exposure in the esophagus. In addition to measuring the pH, you can uh, do a less common test uh, called impedance. So uh, impedance would measure the distance of reflux up the esophagus. You would do this with a catheter that's placed in the esophagus and it'll stay in place for several days while you're measuring the impedance. And it'll also measure the pH of the esophagus. However, this is uh, arduous and uh, comfortable uh, for the patient uh, a lot of times, um, but uh, I've not seen one of these placed, um, but uh, it is available. As far as the guidelines are concerned, they give you a management algorithm here. You might have a patient that presents with refractory nerve, you optimize your PPI therapy, you'll not get any response. You excluded other etiologies, meaning they're not having a heart attack. You're convinced that it's esophageal, that their symptoms are esophageal disease. Let's move over to the left side here. Let's say they have typical symptoms. They have the heartburn, they have uh, regurgitation. Do the upper endoscopy. Obviously, if you find something on upper endoscopy, you'll treat it. But let's say the upper endoscopy is normal. Moving on down that algorithm, you, uh, they recommend a reflex monitor. This is where we get into what I just mentioned with pH testing. In this algorithm, if they on the left side have a low pretest probability, then you would stop their PPI and do the pH testing. However, on the right side, they have a high pretest probability, you would test them on the medication. However, this is a, another algorithm. Uh, this one recommending stopping the PPI for seven days. And this is uh, what I've seen uh, more commonly prior to placing the pH uh, monitor for 96 hours. The three columns at the bottom, if you've got the pH monitor uh, uh, data and you have zero days of acid exposure, then you uh, don't have abnormal acid exposure in the esophagus. And you probably consider 
a diagnosis such as functional heartburn. However, on the right column, if you have greater than two days or greater of positive of uh, abnormal acid exposure in the esophagus, then you have too much acid. You don't need to uh, decrease the amount of acid. The main way to do that would be with a PPI. Interpretation of uh, pH testing. I've gotten some, but we'll go to it again. Functional heartburn, acid exposure time is normal. And their symptoms are not related to the reflux that they have. Reflux hypersensitivity, acid exposure in the esophagus is normal, but the patients are hypersensitive to it. Their symptoms are present when they're having their normal reflux event. Third patients have normal acid exposure and uh, uh, you have the complications of it uh, at that time, like we discussed. A lot of words on this uh, screen. Kind of what I wanted to pull out here was how how we surveil for adenocarcinoma in patients with Barrett's esophagus. It's called the Seattle Protocol. You can see I circled it in red there on the left side of the screen. Over on the right side of the screen, uh, the column there represents an esophagus, and the darkest uh, color towards the bottom, uh, the darkest pink there towards the bottom is the uh, area of Barrett's esophagus. And in the upper part of the column, the tan color is normal esophagus. What we do with the Seattle protocol is we'll take a, what we call four quadrant biopsies. So four biopsies in each quadrant. And then we come proximal, 22 centimeters. And then we take four more quadrant biopsies. And proximal, a couple centimeters. <clears throat> take four more biopsies. So we get it, the top of the circumferential area, and then we biopsy uh, the tongues as they go up every couple of weeks. We send all those biopsies to the lab for evaluation to determine is there adenocarcinoma present, is there high grade dysplasia present. As far as the management topic, we're going to lifestyle, medical therapy, uh, Barrett's management, surgery, endoscopic uh, therapy, and then. Um, Stricture and dilation. This picture over here on the right is with the how we would treat a stricture. This is the only time I'll mention it, so I kind of threw it in here. This is uh, shows a balloon. You can balloon dilate. You can also uh, do what we call savory dilation as well. So there are a couple ways for us to improve stricture. Lifestyle brings us to our fourth learning objective: what lifestyle changes can improve merit? Weight loss especially if BMI is greater than 25, because as we discussed, obesity, uh, specifically central abdominal obesity, increased abdominal pressure, increased amount of reflux, the weight loss would be helpful. Not necessarily recommended to avoid certain foods, spicy chocolate, acidic, but some patients it helps. And so uh, if, they, if they tell you it helps, I say go for it. Uh, a low carbohydrate uh, diet would be helpful. Elevating the head of the bed. Some people do this using cinder blocks under the head of the bed. It's been shown to be helpful. Avoiding late night meals, especially fatty late night meals. Avoiding NSAIDs, stopping smoking and alcohol. The smoking and alcohol cessation are recommended by guidelines. However, there's not great evidence uh, to, support, to support that stopping those two will actually help your reflux. Which the following is a predictor of suboptimal response of heartburn to PPI therapy. If someone has heartburn, you give them a PPI, he's not going to respond. Administration of a PPI before breakfast. And then that's the correct way to take it, probably not. Administration of an SI omeprazole, high acid exposure time on pH testing, presence of IBS, presence of LA grade B reflux esophagitis. Here's the patients with IBS is a predictor of being a non-responder to PPI therapy. Uh, distractor E, if you have esophagitis, you'll probably benefit from a PPI. Distractor C, if you have high acid exposure time, if you have too much acid in your esophagus, you will benefit from PPI. The mainstay of medical management is PPI. You can see the different drugs you have 
uh, at your disposal there uh, on the right. The most common ones that we use in an outpatient setting would be omeprazole. Lansoprazole is, has a liquid formulation. And so patients that don't want pills, they can tolerate pills that have some kind of feeding food, or if they're inpatient, that would be the formulation that I use. And toprazole would be the most common one that I use in inpatient. It also has an IV form. It's important to tell your patients to take them correctly meaning on an empty stomach, 30 to 45 minutes prior to meals. Usually most patients will take them once a day. And so this will be prior to breakfast. Most patients uh, will with their, uh, have their symptoms resolved with take the PPI. And if they don't resolve, consider switching intra-class, meaning omeprazole and toprazole or antoprazole with toprazole prior to switching classes of drugs i.e. switching to H2 blockers. You want to eventually, over the next month, titrate down to the lowest effective dose. Uh, it does help with non-erosive reflux disease, like we discussed, or okay in pregnancy, possible associated adverse effects. You can see some of them there. The ones with the best data are probably infections, specifically C, increased risk of C. diff and chronic PPIE, increased uh, pneumonia in hospitalized patients, on PPI. Um, the rest of the associations are based mostly off of retrospective reviews uh, and uh, don't have great data to support them, but uh, they are listed as possible associations. Mm -hmm. Management, if esophagi, erosive esophagitis on EGD, esophagitis on EGD is present, we're going to recommend high dose PPI for two months. So in this case, omeprazole, 40 milligrams, two months. Again, if esophagitis, especially grade C or D esophagitis, pantoprazole, 40, DID, two months. Lansoprazole, 30, DID, two months. If it's successful, then daily dosing prior to breakfast, uh, like we discussed. If uh, PPI, if they're on PPI, DID, and still symptomatic, consider reevaluation with EGD. It might be cancer per se, which won't respond to PPI. Duration, if they have erosive esophagitis, if they have Barrett's esophagus, they're going to be on lifelong PPI therapy, usually once daily dosing. And you can down titrate to the lowest effective dose, but it will likely be lifelong. Cured without complications, meaning no esophagitis or non erosive patients with non erosive reflux disease can eventually taper off PPI or even consider H2 blockers. Reason, most common reason for PPI failure is non compliant. Just forget to take them, they're out of the prescription, they were feeling good, their symptoms improved, so they stopped taking. Incorrect timing, being 30 45 minutes prior to breakfast uh, on an empty stomach. Uh, incorrect doses, maybe they're rapid metabolizer, not term breakthrough, uh, maybe you have the wrong diagnosis, something functional. This shows the patient's suspect likelihood of patients suspect uh, suspected to improve on PPI therapy. Over on the left side, you have patients presenting with cough, or chest pain. They're unlikely, lowest likelihood to improve to put on PPI therapy. Versus the right side, patients who presenting complaint of regurgitation and heartburn, especially, have the highest likelihood of responding to PPI therapy. The therapies that I mentioned are histamine 2 receptor antagonists. If uh, they have uncomplicated GERD, meaning no esophagitis, could be gene, a good uh, trial uh, H2 blocker. H2 blockers can be used at night, which can be especially helpful if they're symptoms are nocturnal. However, H2 blockers are limited by tachyphylaxis, meaning you have a uh, diminishing response to the medication. Uh, some patients uh, really find sulfate to be helpful, paraphate, they work for it. Uh, Baclofen has been prescribed. I've never uh, used it, uh, but it uh, could be a possibility. And then Mylantin, Gaviscon, uh, that people have success with that which is the following is a known consequence 
of successful anti-reflux surgery. So you have anti-reflux surgery, you treat your GERD, what could you expect to be a consequence of that? Delayed phase gastric emptying, melting and regurgitation, dysphagia, esophageal hypermotility, small bowel bacterial overgrowth. Definitely going to be the dysphagia. Food has difficulty going down all the way into my stomach. Uh, as far as management goes with surgical options, the uh, most common surgical option is going to be a missing fundification. And surgery has actually been shown to be in patients uh, with GERD uh, almost as helpful as a PPI therapy. And most patients can stop PPIs after surgery, at least for some amount of time. If you have a patient who has not responded to PPIs, then it's a, uh, they're not going to be likely to respond to surgery. So be patient. surgery would be indicated for patients who were on PPIs, had a good response, and for whatever reason, you know, financial, didn't want to take medicine, whatever reason, didn't want to continue the PPI, they wanted to opt for surgery instead. If uh, the patient is you do an EGD and there's no esophagitis, meaning the diagnosis might still be in question, then you'll want to obtain an EDH, esophageal PDH test to determine that they actually do have abnormal esophageal acid exposure. Manometry is required in all patients prior to surgery, mainly to rule out acrylation obstructive process. And with an experienced surgeon, can be as effective as the missing fund application uh, is where they take the fundus, the upper part of the stomach in the diagram there, and they wrap it around just uh, distal to the uh, G junction, the diaphragm, and they uh, applicate it. Uh, take wood or sew it on the glue back together. It's slightly better at controlling GERD symptoms compared to PPI. However, down the road, will have a certain percentage of patients significant can be uh, with worsening dysphagia, worsening gas bloating they have in their stomach because they're no longer able to vent the gas out of their stomach. They no longer have that ability to relax their lower esophageal sphincter to allow gas to vent. 50% of patients. After surgery, will require medical therapy, new PPI, or revision of the surgery. In some patients, as opposed to a Nissen, uh, a Ruin Y could be helpful, but only in patients who uh, meet, other, meet the other criteria to receive a Ruin Y. And they have obesity, maybe some complications, high BMI, complications of obesity. And in that case, the ruin line might actually help their obesity. That would be the goal, which would help the reflux disease. Uh, it's assuming they have no contraindications. And you want to avoid speed gastrectomy in these uh, patients with reflux. Another uh, surgical option would be magnetic sphincter augmentation. This is where uh, the sphincter device there in the middle in between the uh, guy's fingers uh, is placed around the lower esophageal sphincter to augment the amount of lower esophageal sphincter contraction. Uh, these can, this is very helpful. It can be as helpful as surgery, being slightly better in some um, studies. And it can be better than PPI in some, for some patients in controlling symptoms. However, similar to surgery, you'll run in, you have the uh, possibility of running into complications down the road, such as dysphagia, and even more so than surgery. And they may require revision of the magnets or even stretching. For instance, I've been a part of a couple of scopes that have had these that have gotten too tight. The patient will present with severe dysphagia. And so what we'll do is we'll go down with the endoscope and balloon dilate 
these magnets. And you can actually, under fluoroscopy, see them there pop open, pop away from each other. And uh, hopefully, it helps the patient with their symptoms. Uh, Barrett's esophagus, the main stay of management is daily lifelong PPI. But there's been a lot of interest and a lot of studies done uh, with uh, looking at the NSAID and specifically aspirin to help prevent the progression of Barrett's esophagus to adenocarcinoma. And this is one study that I wanted to point out. Um, they uh, Looked over eight years and randomized patients in a one to one to one to one arm. They had 2,500 patients. Their primary endpoints were all college mortality, adenocarcinoma, and uh, high grade dysplasia at the end of the eight year. They had patients on high dose PPI, high dose PPI with aspirin, low dose PPI, and low dose PPI with aspirin. And the number needed to treat 34 patients with PPI and 43 with aspirin. At the same time, the current guidelines do not recommend aspirin therapy for prevention of adenocarcinoma in various esophagus. But it is an interesting um, little talk there. Management of various esophagus, esophagus. If erosive esophagitis is present, then treat the esophagitis with twice daily high dose PPI, typically for a couple months. Then you'll go take another look, repeat EGD, then take your Barrett Seattle protocol biopsies to rule out high grade dysplasia to rule out adenocarcinoma. If patients have no if Barrett's esophagus with no dysplasia, the pathologist results read intestinal metaplasia in Barrett's. You can repeat your EGD in three or maybe even five years and then repeat your biopsies at that time. If in your Seattle protocol biopsy, you determine that they have low grade dysplasia, the risk of progression to high grade dysplasia and adenocarcinoma is approximately 20% per year. You want to keep a closer watch on these patients. If patients have low grade dysplasia and they've been on PPI high dose for two to three months, repeat an EGD. If the dysplasia uh, improves or stabilizes, you can surveil them one year or you can send them for ablation endoscopically of the uh, uh, Barrett's. In patients with high grade dysplasia, you'll want to refer for ablation or resection at that time. 50 year old obese man presents for three month history of retrogenal. Heavy pressure like chest pain, worse when he's moving around, not associated with meals, no nocturnal pain. And he's tried some acid reducer therapy and it's not working. What's your next step? Well, his chest pain is pressure like an elephant on his chest. He needs to see a cardiologist. Current trends in management of GERD, this is the best I could come up with for endoscopic therapy. There are currently no guidelines, there are no guidelines that recommend endoscopic management of. Of uh, GERD. However, there have been lots of uh, companies that have tried to come up with uh, things. This is one esophagix. They'll go down and basically perform a, an application with an endoscopy. Uh, it helped the patient's symptoms out a little bit, and it did in, in, improve the pH in the esophagus over uh, time, but the, uh, uh, the changes and the benefits were too minimal to recommend at this time. And then let's keep in mind that management with quality of life, patients with GERD have an increased, uh, especially nocturnal symptoms have an increased uh, uh, greater impact in their quality of life, a lower, lower um, uh, satisfaction, life satisfaction, worse sleep, especially daytime symptoms, increased time off of work. I'd like to thank you for your time tonight. Again, Trace Hebner, here's my contact information. And I appreciate your uh, coming tonight. We have questions. <laughs> we have several questions. Uh, so, is there a role of surgery if in the management of GERD? I can cover that. Explain the decreased decreased risk of adenocarcinoma. Um, you have increased risk of adenocarcinoma specifically with uh, Barrett's esophagus. 
When do you initiate a workup regarding family history? For example, siblings or parents with gastric cancer, would you recommend screening with an EGD? Uh, an uncle, cousin, etc. cetera. Uh, wouldn't hurt, I guess. I, I'm uh, not sure exactly. I would have to look that up. Are there seasonal variations in GERD? Not that I'm aware of, although it's good to think. Maybe increased mucus secretion in the winter time, maybe better GERD in the winter time, but you might be drinking more coffee in the winter. <laughs> Can you eliminate GERD by changing your diet? I think I covered that pretty well. 